Hey everybody, and welcome to TGIK, live in the uh, Heptio Studios here in Seattle. How's everyone doing today? I'm your host, Chris Nova. Uh, just opening up all my youtube -y stuff. Hold on, folks. I got, I like, we, we can't miss the hello everyone section of today, so I'm gonna make sure I like have everything lined up for that. Um, but yeah, it's good to see everybody. Let's let's see. It looks like folks are already in the chat here. Let's see what we got going on. Uh, Olav was our winner today. He was the first one. Um, joy to the Kubernetes world. Uh, a decent. Good to see you. Been seeing you a lot lately. Thanks for joining again. Uh, good evening from Russia. Uh, evening from the Scottish Highlands. Nice to see you, Rory. Hey guys, greeting from Hamburg. Good to see you, Suresh. Uh, and then George is joining us. Uh, George is on the, uh, the Heptio account, and he says. All right, welcome. This is George. I'll be assisting Chris with notes. Um, yeah, so we always have a hack MD that George will put in uh, the chat here in a moment if folks want to take notes or uh, it's a good way to share links since we can't share links in the uh, the YouTube chat over here. Uh, we have good night from Paris. Good to see you, Philippe from Braunschweig. Christopher, happy Friday. Hi from Tanzania. Hi from Macedonia. Hi from Bristol. And there's George's uh, hack MD link as per usual. It's good to see everyone, and as always, we have people from literally all around the world, so thank you for joining, no matter uh, what time of day or night it is. Uh, yeah, so this week on TGIK, we're kind of following up uh, a little bit on what we talked about uh, last week. So kind of on a whim, I decided to do the Builda uh, container image building tool, and we had a lot of folks who were interested in it and asked a lot of questions about other container image building tools. And we kind of thought that maybe it would be a little bit of fun to kind of do a quick mini series uh, that was a little unexpected. So that's what we're doing today is we're going to be doing another container image building tool and talking about how this compares to Builda from last week and the, uh, the pros and cons uh, or just the, the technical differences between the two tools. Uh, and we'll go into like a little bit more detail about uh, Canico, which is what we're going to be talking about today a little bit later. Looks like more folks are saying hi. We have hi from Austria. Steve Sloka, good to see you. Happy Friday. Hi from Phoenix, Arizona. Yes, love the desert. Uh, Lamati, are you going to continue this awesome container build episodes with Image next week? Okay, so Lamati was the first one to ask the million dollar question. So like, I feel like, here you go, Lamati. You can have uh, a go gopher um, for your prize for asking the million dollar question. Um, but yeah, so I think I, I don't know if it's gonna be next week, but I, I think doing, um, a TGIK on image, or at least a TGIK on, uh, you know, another one of these container image building tools and talking about image a little bit on there. And honestly, I don't know if I'm even saying that correctly, but I'm going to just call it image for now, or maybe ng would be a better way of pronouncing it. Uh, but yeah, I think we're, we're going to do it. Uh, I've been talking to some folks about it, and uh, I'm going to poke around at it a little bit more. And hopefully we can, we can get one more of these container image building uh, sessions out of the way, um, and we could talk about that one. So yes, stay tuned. Coming soon to a TGIK near you. Uh, Duffy, good to see you. Hi all. Duffy's got the wrench, which means he can help out if folks need anything. Uh, Saeed, hello from London. Uh, good to see you, Saeed. Uh, I guess since we're on the topic of London, I'm going to be in London next week for VelocityCon. I have a keynote. Uh, so if folks in London want to get together and talk Kubernetes and hang out, uh, feel free to hit me up on any of the usual avenues and uh, we can get together and, and talk Kubernetes. There's usually a group of us who get together in London and go out um, and just talk about like what's been going on in the Kubernetes space. So if you want to join, let me know. Um, we have Bob. Hello from beautiful Hollywood, California. Good to see you, Bob. I was just in Los Angeles on Wednesday, I want to say, for like an hour. It was good to be there. Good old L.A. Uh, Robert Lancer, hello from New York City. Hello, Robert, good to see you. Okay, so I'm gonna move right in because we got a lot to cover today uh, for the This Week in Kubernetes and we have some other links I wanna show folks. So let's cut over to the screen plus my face here. I love this view because I'm like up in the top corner and you still get to see my screen. Um, okay, so uh, here's our hack MD that we put together. You can do like the split view here at the top and you can like go between the different views or whatever. Um, I like to do this one so you get the markdown on the left and then here on the right we get the actual rendered markdown. Uh, and you can see we have a pretty big list of stuff to go through today. Uh, so let's just get started. And actually I'm gonna cough and have some Diet Coke really quick. Okay, so I think the, um, <coughs> the first one here is Kubernetes 1.12.2 is out and here is the change log. Um, and I like just saw another email going around about 1.13. 
can't believe we're already on version 1.13. I literally feel like we were on 1.4 just the other day. Um, so Kubernetes flying by as per usual. Uh, so while we're here on the change log, this is actually a question somebody asked me in my workshop I gave earlier this week at All Things Open, which was a great conference, by the way. Um, which was, where is like the de facto go-to spot to learn about all the changes in Kubernetes? Uh, so we're looking at it here. This link that George put in, uh, our HackMD, is a change log, and they actually build uh, all of the change log here from the git commits of all the PRs that were merged. So you can come in and actually get all the technical nitty-gritty detail that you're looking for. Uh, more people saying hello. We have uh, hi from Turkey, and Josh X says hi all as well. Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, if you want to come and check out what changed in version 1.12.1 uh, to version 1.12.2, feel free to come take a look. Um, and then, of course, you can always grab all of the, uh, the binaries, the client binaries, the server binaries, and the node binaries here as well. And that's uh, the official community release of Kubernetes. This is the spot to come get it. <coughs> Excuse me. I like, had a cough for a couple weeks, got a little bit better, and now I'm back to having a cough again. Um, so it looks like our next one here, we have Weave Flux version 1.6 and 1.8. So those are out. Let's look at 1.8 since this is like the more recent one. Uh, so jo I think Joe did a TGIK on Weave Flux a while ago, so I won't go into a ton of detail here. But if you want to go to the TGIK repository and find out more about Flux, you certainly can. Um, I think the TLDR is Flux uh, helps solving a lot of the CI/CD problems that you see in Kubernetes, and it looks like we have another big release of it. So hats off to our friends at Weave for continuing to uh, support and maintain a helpful tool that makes the community more effective. Oh, this is an exciting one. Uh, Heptio Arc version 0 0.9.9 bug re fix release is out. I'm curious what bug fix we fix. Oh, okay, so this is another one of the discuss.kubernetes IO things. Um, so yeah, I've had a few folks ask me about uh, just this site in general. If you don't know about it, it's a pretty cool site. It's called discuss.kubernetes.io. It's sort of like an active uh, um, bit of documentation, so you can actually open up issues and respond to them, and you can like log in with your GitHub here. If you just do log in, you can like access it with your GitHub. Um, and then once you're logged in with GitHub, you can actually come in and like I could come and type a reply if I wanted to, and um, it's pretty handy. But yeah, if you want to come check out the ARC version 0 0.9.9 .9 bug fix release, let's see if we can find, here are the binaries, but what does it say? Okay, check if init container's key exists before attempting to remove volume mounts. Okay, it looks like we just had uh, some logical uh, discrepancy, so we just like reordered a few things in ARC. Um, and I guess while we're here, um, we've been talking about doing Heptio Arc for a while, and I feel like it's just going to be another week of me being like, we're going to do it one day. Um, but we are going to do it one day. I think what's kind of holding us back is we want to um, make sure that we have the engineers somehow looped into the call. So like, maybe we can get some time on the calendar in the future and have one of the engineers join me here in the studio or something. Um, but anyway, Heptio Arc is really rad. It allows you to back up your Kubernetes cluster, uh, not only just the Kubernetes resources, but also the underlying data store that's uh, stored on all of your physical volumes underneath, or persistent volumes underneath. Uh, so that's really exciting. Um, we have two more people join the chat. We have Hi Chris from New Zealand. Awesome, nice to see you, Tom. Uh, Mount Cook is on my list soon, so I'll be sure to let folks know if I'm heading down to New Zealand. And we have somebody from Boulder, Colorado. Uh, I've climbed more in Boulder Canyon than I know what to do with, but I love Boulder. I used to live there. Uh, how's Boulder today? I'm assuming it's like in the mid-70s and sunny and everybody's really happy, because that's pretty much every day in Boulder. Uh, so anyway, good to see you too. Okay, so that's Heptio Arc, Weave Flux, change log for 1.12.2. Let's move on. Uh, the next one is the Datadog folks share how they run Kate's clusters the very hard way. So, um, so, this, so let's see what's going on here. Uh, my name is Rob. Uh, I lead the compute team here at Datadog. This is the team. Oh. I'm going to turn this down and just kind of skim through this and see what we got going on. OK. So it looks like they had to kind of go through and learn about all of the underlying infrastructure of Kubernetes. And they put together this really nice presentation on how they get everything up and running. Oh, this looks cool. This might be a really good uh, put it on like two times the speed and listen to it at your desk type of video. Um, if you guys don't do this, you can come here to settings and you can come to speed and you can go to two here. Um, I actually like to do this with the TGIK recordings. Um, and it doesn't adjust the pitch. It just makes everything go faster. Usually we get the 
And like after you listen to it for a bit, it's actually pretty exciting because um, you kind of like get into the two times mode or whatever and it actually begins to sound normal. But you can like knock out an hour long video in 30 minutes. So it's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, that looks like a good one I would totally come check out. Uh, Sean Smith, hello from Seattle, everyone. Sorry I'm late. Welcome, Sean. Good to see you. Okay, uh, next we have our old friend Michael Hasenblas. Uh, interesting bit of trivia between me and Michael is he was one of the few people at the original Cubicorn release table party at GopherCon, two, two GopherCons ago when we released uh, Cubicorn. He was the one who like wrote the Reddit article that blew up and uh, helped me get Cubicorn to number one trending on GitHub. Uh, so that's like my last in-person memory of my time with Michael. It was a really good day. Um, but anyway, he blogs a lot, and it looks like he has a great blog entry on applied Kubernetes security. Uh, Jeff Settle, J Jay Sizzle on the phone. Good to see you, Jeff. New Jersey is in the house. Welcome, Jeff. Good to see you. Uh, Jeff is one of the folks who works here at Heptio, so I call him Jay Sizzle. Um, he's a good dude. Uh, and Ashish says, start at 2 and come down to 1.5. Your ears get used to it. Okay, so she suggests for if you're going to speed up a YouTube video, um, start at 2x the speed and then come down a little bit and then your ears actually get used to it. Uh, so anyway, here is Michael's blog I have pulled up. Uh, it looks like pizza first is on the agenda. That's pretty funny. Uh, and also very Michael if you knew him. Uh, so yeah, on my way home from Berlin, we had a really good cloud native CNCF meetup, uh, applied Kubernetes security. Um, this looks like a really great resource, honestly. I would, I would spend some time coming through and looking at this. And in general, one of the things that I feel like a lot of people who are new to Kubernetes kind of miss out of the gates is uh, how important security concerns are with Kubernetes. And even basic, like using basic RBAC and securing your cluster and having a good policy in place for your organization is super important. Um, and that's just like more of a procedural level of security. But um, actually understanding the complexity of your cluster and where potential vulnerabilities would be is a whole other exercise that you do need to go through in Kubernetes. Simply using Kubernetes does not automatically give you security, although there are tools out there that make it a lot easier. Um, Heptio Asana Boy is a really great example of just checking to make sure you're running a conformant cluster. Um, but this looks like it goes off into a lot of the um, exciting and probably uh, low-hanging fruit for securing a Kubernetes cluster. So if you're thinking about running in production, this is probably a good resource for you to come check out. Okay, let's see what's next. I told you all we had a lot of these, so I'm trying to go kind of quick on them. Uh, what in the hell is a pod anyways? Uh, well, it's more, one or more containers with shared volume or shared storage and shared networking if you look at the Kubernetes.io docs. Actually, I want to see if I just got that right from memory. Kubernetes.io pod. If I got this right, it's going to be super hilarious. Uh, pods, Kubernetes. Pods are the smallest deployable units of computing that can be created in Kubernetes. A pod is a group of one or more containers with shared storage and network. Yeah, from memory, Chris Nova, everybody. Uh, let's see what Dominic has to say about a pod, though. Uh, so Kubernetes is a container orchestration engine uh, designed to host containerized applications on a set of nodes. Uh, OK, so I think he goes in and just talks about a pod in reference to all of the Kubernetes objects. Oh, this is actually really good. OK, so I have a link for something like this later, because this is actually relevant to Canico for today. Um, processing a pod. So status in a pod is really important. Um, oh, Duffy's saying something. I feel like Duffy always has important comments, and I need to read them. Uh, let's see what Duffy says. On the security topic, OPIC is another good read related to Federic, Federic's pods, not pod, the talk that Federic gave. OK, so uh, Duffy, if you want to add a link for folks to the uh, HackMD, that would be rad. Um, anyway, uh, you can see that um, states of a pod are important, and we're going to actually get a pod into a completed state uh, later today when we actually generate some container images with Canico uh, or Conico. I'm not even, but I feel like Conico is like a gas station. Like, let's call it Canico. Okay, plus one for Canico, plus two for Conico. Let's see what the people have to say. Um, anyway, this talks about all the different uh, states a pod can be in. So if you really want to like brush up on your pod of trivia and really understand how it is executed and probably more importantly how they're terminated or what the policy is around them, this looks like a really good read um, to really gain a mastery of probably the most important resource in all of Kubernetes, the one that's actually running your application, the pod. Uh, so this is a good resource. I would check that out. Uh, let's see. Oh, folks are typing. Hold on. We'll wait for Duffy to finish typing his thing. Um, but I think our next one is, 
uh, moving canary deployments on AWS using ELB to Kubernetes using traffic. Okay, so I did a TGIK on traffic, um, which was actually one of our more successful TGIKs if you measured it in terms of uh, views of people who were interested. Um, she says Google for what happens when Kate's. Uh, no, I, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I think it would be funny though. Maybe I'll do it and tweet about it afterwards or something. Uh, Suresh votes for Conoco, plus two for Conoco. I, I really can't say that because that just sounds like a gas station. Anyway, uh, moving canary deployments on AWS using ELB to Kubernetes using traffic. Uh, what do, when people say canary deployments, they usually can mean more than one thing. Let's just understand that first. Uh, canary in our use case was used by one of our APIs, which we served and gave our compensation for the earlier method for canary deployments that were on Kubernetes. Okay, so I think this is um, using ELB to Kubernetes using traffic. Interesting. So it's somehow we're doing an ELB, but we still have traffic involved. This I, I'm curious what this is, but I don't know have to, if I have time to actually go through and, and dig into all of this. There's a lot of diagrams here. Uh, let's see this one. Oh, I see what's going on here. It looks like we have myapp.example.com and Canary in my app. Okay, so I think what they mean by Canary in this case is simple, uh, simply like having an application that you're gonna put up and running somewhere on the public internet and then controlling traffic uh, to the Canary version, meaning like the, the first version. Uh, the word Canary comes from like uh, the first Canary coming out and singing. So usually people refer to the word Canary in technical uh, situations as like the first rendition of something. Uh, in this case, it's the first rendition of releasing an application on the internet. And I think this is just a blog that talks about how using ELBs and traffic, you can control um, the differences between like one domain and the other so that you can ease people into your, uh, your initial release of your application. So I think that's what's going on here. Um, so that's interesting if, if you're working in Amazon and you're uh, trying to ease people into your application and like sort of slowly switch or transition into that new application. Um, okay, next up, uh, K features is now K enhancements. Okay, I'm sorry, can I just rant about this for a second? I mean, I, I'm here in the TGIK studio. Um, using K as a shorthand for Kubernetes I really strongly disagree with it, and I would say 99 of most new contributors to Kubernetes I've talked to about this at conferences in the wild um, are confused by this new parlance. And I would encourage all people to uh, actually type out Kubernetes um, explicitly, uh, both so that people know concretely what you're talking about, and so that you don't create this sort of like uh, hidden line of like we have some shorthand that you don't know about because we're in some special club or something that you you're not you know welcome to. Uh, so for inclusivity, inclusivity, I like to encourage people to actually type out uh, Kubernetes, even though it is a little bit longer. I think it's important. So let's see if I can't change this really quick. Uh, right here, K okay, features. So Kubernetes is now Kubernetes slash enhancements. Um, I just think, yeah, again, it's a little more inclusive and friendly to newer folks to the project. Okay, so next we have, oh, I guess I can click on this. Um, if you want to come check it out, you can go to github.com slash Kubernetes slash enhancements. And this is where all of the, uh, the big feature requests basically for the Kubernetes project come through. So I think they just renamed the repository. So this is good to know. And also uh, the way GitHub works, don't, you don't have to worry about it, but they have this really cool redirect feature uh, built in so that all of your Git reference paths still work. So if you actually go to Kubernetes slash features, you'll see that you automatically get forwarded back here to Kubernetes enhancements. So if you actually try to like include uh, you know, software from the old name um, and it tries to pull that software down, it'll get a 301 redirect and as long as whatever you're using to vendor that code uh, responds to 301 redirects, you'll actually get this new code and this new repo name. Uh, so thanks to our friends at GitHub for doing that for us. That's a really cool feature. Um, probably the most famous example of this is if you go to github.com slash docker uh, slash docker um, you'll see that it'll actually forward you to Moby Moby, um, but all of the github.com slash docker docker import paths and all the Go programs in the world still work. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, Saeed says, but aliasing K for, uh, K for Kubernetes in the terminal is fine. Um, I, I mean, I just think documentation, it's important to be explicit. I mean, I think in an, a Unix command line world where keystrokes are important and it's, you know, for the sake of a demo, I think it's okay, especially if you call it out. Um, but just in code, especially in documentation, like, is it really that hard to do a find and replace for K slash to K Kubernetes to help new folks? Um, that's my two cents anyway. Feel free to do whatever you guys want. 
Okay, so let's see what's next. Uh, cube admin GA. Okay, so this is really important um, because we've been talking about bringing cube admin to GA like ever since I can remember. This has been on uh, folks' mind for quite some time. Um, but we're very close, thanks to uh, all of our friends at SIG Cluster Lifecycle, and I know Tim uh, has done a lot of work in making this thing come to life. Uh, so once it goes to GA, this is going to be a huge, uh, a huge like b breaking point for the Cube Admin and Kubernetes infrastructure realm of things. Um, for a lot of companies, can't adopt a tool until it's got some sort of GA level support. Um, so actually, moving Cube Admin to GA officially is more of a political move than it actually is a software level move. Um, but that political move is really, in my mind, going to help drive adoption and further standardize uh, Cube Admin as the de facto way of installing the Kubernetes components. Um, so Duffy says, yay, Cube Admin. Yes, uh, Cube Admin is amazing. It's what Cubicorn uses, it's what we use in the cluster API to bring up our clusters. Um, and it's, in my mind, sort of the, the, the official way of, of doing um, the Kubernetes stand up -y parts of bringing up a cluster. So thank you to our friends at Cluster Lifecycle and a big congratulations and thank you for all of their hard work because uh, this has not been easy. Um, getting something to GA in Kubernetes is extremely tedious and takes a lot of time. Uh, so thank you again. We're all very grateful for that hard work. Uh, okay, so what's next? Oh, uh, so yeah, I don't know if you folks have been following the news recently, but friendly reminder, I'm transgender and uh, I'm a person and I should have basic civil rights and it's important to me to share my voice uh, and let folks know that I just want to talk about Kubernetes and uh, my personal life should have no impact on that whatsoever. Uh, so friendly reminder, we're everywhere and we contribute to Kubernetes and we're right here live on TGIK. Uh, so this is important to me, and if it's important to you too, feel free to share a screenshot of this on Twitter and show your support this week. It's pretty important. Uh, so this is a picture of me last week, or earlier this week at the All Things Open conference. Um, so I put this on stage as well. So thanks for letting me share that bit this week. Uh, next up is this really exciting blog. Um, if you're interested in unprivileged container builds, which this whole conversation is a long conversation we're about to go off in the weeds on. Uh, this blog, in my mind, really bottom lines it for everyone. Um, if you want to come in and actually get an understanding of how a container is built, what actually needs to happen on the host and the container file system in order to generate a container image, and then why a lot of container building tools like Docker um, require you to be root in order for you to build a container. Now this whole conversation is like relevant because uh, if you're building a CI CD system to automatically build and deploy containers, giving a, a Jenkins job root on that system is, is pretty dangerous and pretty terrifying for a lot of um, operators out there. So this goes into the nitty gritty detail of uh, the different sys, like these are all the different syscalls you would possibly need to use and can you do any of this without root? Uh, this is relevant for today's episode because uh, the, the container image building tool Canico or Conico um, advertises that you can build a container um, without root access on your underlying system, and we're about to put that to the test. Um, so if you want to find out more and actually see a comparison of here's image, I know a lot of folks have been talking about that, and build a, and then we're doing uh, Canico today, and it looks like there's this fourth one, maybe we can do a TGIK on this as well, called Orca Build. Um, in understanding um, how all of the different container building tools come into play, and then even understanding in detail how all the different uh, namespaces are relevant to building a container image. This blog is, in my mind, the, a great resource. I, have, I haven't finished reading it yet, um, so we might be referring to some of this today on the call, but I plan on reading this very soon. Um, I just found it earlier this week, so this is a good one to check out. Okay, so um, looks like our last one here, Ignite Talk, what is Kubernetes? Uh, it's another YouTube video. Let me close this. Uh, oh, it's Joe and Craig and Brendan at DevOps Days Kansas City. And I think it's probably the three of them talking about what is Kubernetes. Oh my God, look how cute this is. And they have cute little drawings. Uh, so this is adorable. Uh, so Sean Smith says, uh, yeah, I run a fleet of VMs that have that access to the Docker daemon to build them that get uh, paved every once in a while. Okay, so it looks like Sean is having, uh, this is going back to the running a privileged container image build. Um, so Sean is having some of those woes at uh, runtime right now. Okay, so yeah, if you want to listen to Joe Craig and Brendan talk about Kubernetes, uh, it looks like there's a little Ignite talk here you can go and check out. That might be a good, like, you know, in between meetings if you have a few extra minutes, go listen to that really quick. 
Um, but yeah, I think that's all of our stuff from around the community. We're only 25 minutes in, so not terrible. We got, we're able to make it through that pretty quick this week. And uh, we're going to jump into Canico pretty, pretty soon here. <coughs> okay, I want to catch up on what folks are saying before I switch over to Canico building mode. Um, let's see in the chat. Uh, so Duffy Cooley says, plus, uh, like, that looks like one trillion, maybe more. I don't know how many, a lot of zeros. Um, if anybody can find out actually the proper way of pronouncing that, you should drop it in chat because that would be fun. Um, Tom says, that's why I'm here. I'm supporting you. Okay, I think these are people talking about my transgender um, uh, sign that I had up a second ago. So thanks, folks. Um, and then Duffy says, also follow Akira Suda on Twitter. Okay, so Duffy suggests following this person on Twitter um, if you enjoy the Unprivileged Container blog that I just brought up. Uh, so that's good to know, Duffy, that they are active on Twitter as well. Um, this person has done a ton of work on non-root container stuff. So that's awesome, and I feel like a lot of the, uh, the concerns folks are having around container image building tools uh, all revolve around whether or not you have to run as a privileged user or not, um, aka running as root. Um, uh, so Gustavo, hello from Chicago, welcome, thank you for joining. And Jeremy says, thanks for going over the news. Yep, totally, like Chris Nova news broadcaster, right? And now we're going to turn into Chris Nova, uh, Linux enthusiast. Okay, uh, so Jeremy says, ton of stuff to read now. Okay, cool. Uh, let us know what you think. We're on Twitter, we're on Slack, uh, and I'm, you know, these, these things at the beginning I think are important because it kind of keeps uh, us up to speed with what's going on in the cloud native space, which is super... Um, super hard to keep up with. And I guess why we're on that, and this is like, okay, so this is unofficial, so you didn't hear this here. Uh, so like, I gotta like put on my like sneaky hat or whatever. Speaking of the cloud native space, uh, myself and somebody else here at Heptio are starting a new podcast called The Cubelets. And it's gonna be me and her talking about um, sort of an objective approach to understanding what's going on in the cloud native space. So here on TGIK, we take a single tool and we explore a single tool in an episode. Uh, we're going to do a podcast that's more of like listen to it uh, on your way to work kind of thing, um, where we're going to talk about a concept first, and then after we explain the concept and talk about what's important behind the concept, then we can talk about the different tools as sort of an afterthought to that original concept. Uh, so stay tuned for more information about the podcast. We're just now kind of ramping up with it. Um, but that's like the first unofficial official announcement. Um, I'm sure there'll be like Twitter, you know, fireworks and stuff later whenever it happens. But that's just like the uh, behind the scenes gossip. Thanks for joining TGIK. And this is why you get all the sweet, good underground news. Okay, so Josh says that's 14 zeros, 50 would be quadrillion. Uh, so maybe it was a typo. Okay, so Josh actually did the math for us. Thank you, Josh. And it's close to one quadrillion. So Duffy liked that one quadrillion times. Thank you, Duffy. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's jump in my terminal here. Actually, before we do that, before we go into terminal land, let's actually go to GitHub and pull up the uh, Google Container Tools Canico. Okay, so every week before TGIK starts, I always kind of hack around on a tool just enough to kind of like get some demo-y ideas in mind, but a lot of this that I do here, um, I'm kind of just doing on the fly. So there's probably, you know, 80% improv with 20% like I ran a few commands and I got some ideas in my head. Um, and I'm going to just talk about what it was like for me approaching this repository, knowing nothing about this tool other than it advertised to build container images. Uh, Duffy says, nice. Well, that's the measure of my support for trans folks being people with rights. Thank you, Duffy. Like, seriously, right here. It means a lot to me. Duffy, this is for you. Rock on, Duffy. Rock on. Um, Okay, so Google T Container Tools, capitalize GitHub org. That just frustrates me for a number of reasons. Azure does that too. I just really don't like capital letters in URLs. Um, and you see that up here, and that just for some reason or another bothers me. Uh, I have no technical reason why it bothers me. It's just a personal thing. Um, and then we have Canico. So you can come in and you can see it's a Go repository. Um, and if you come down here and look in the README, it talks about like getting it up and running, and they have this demo here. Um, that's a GIF that is actually, it was good because it had a lot of good information, but my one gripe with this GIF is you can't pause it or anything. Um, if you click on it, it just opens up the demo.gif, um, and it goes kind of fast. And there's this one part, let's see if we can see it, um, coming up in about 40 seconds or so, that was actually super relevant that you couldn't find anywhere else in the documentation. Um, let's see if I can actually just like take a screenshot of this so we can save it. Um, that, in my mind, really helped to glue everything together. And it's, 
right here. Canico needs access to these sources. I think we might have missed it, actually. It's the bit that talks about how to upload your context to the cloud. And, and we're going to look at what all this stuff means when we actually generate one of these. But anyway, um, if you want to go through and watch this demo, it's helpful. Um, and there's bits and pieces in here you can't get anywhere else in the docs that are important if you're, if you're trying to do this for the first time. OK. So if you come here on the left, you see we have using Canico. Uh, we talk about build context. So the build context here um, is an interesting bit of vernacular. So this is, uh, you know, this is another gripe of mine with software. Anytime you design software and you use a word like context, or uh, you know, controller is another good example of this, or operator even I feel like is a good example of this, and you have some sort of underlying assumption about what this word means technically, you're basically reteaching your audience um, what this word means in relevance to your program only. And if everybody on the internet went around using the word context however they wanted to, we would have this word that effectively means nothing. And I feel like that has happened with the word context. So in the um, context of the word context of Canico, <coughs> excuse me, um, it basically just means it's a directory with a Docker file in it. And then that directory needs to get tarred up um, using this tar.gzip uh, command, or turn into this tar.gzip file using this tar minus capital C command. Um, and then the context is sort of like what you intend to build. Uh, so I've got, if you look in the, uh, the GitHub repo, let me actually pull up my terminal here. Um, so you can see we're in my go path, GitHub, heptio tgik, which is a tgik repo, episodes 55. Um, if we actually explore this a little bit, we can see that I have a directory called context. And within that context, I have a Docker file. And if we actually uh, cat out this context Docker file, you can see it's uh, literally the world's simplest Docker file. And actually, I'm going to fix that. I don't like that there's not a new line at the end. Um, so let's do context slash Docker file. Um, and actually, I want to do this. Let's see what this does. I don't know if that's going to work or not. Let's see. Nope, I got my new line. Um, I'm actually going to edit this now because that's going to not compile. OK. Um, Said says, all the worlds have been taken in computing. All the words have been taken in computing. Uh, they totally have. Um, OK, so there's our world's simplest Docker file. Uh, let's cut this out one more time. Um, and you can see all it does is it says, echo TGIK is the best way to learn Kubernetes and sleep for 1,000 seconds. And it just runs that in the very simple Ubuntu container. Uh, so this really isn't important because this is just uh, needs to just do something and we're going to try to run it in Kubernetes. But what is important is how we're going to sort of get this Docker file to turn into an image and push that somewhere. Um, Adison says, I really like the tweet from Joe on following more transgender people. It's really great. I think Liz got a lot of new followers that day. Uh, it, it's a shame that we have to do it because like literally I'm sitting here trying to just talk about Docker files and building containers. But it is important to know that you know it's no different than a lot of the other uh, things about people that might make them unique or, or a little bit different than you, perhaps. Um, but yeah, we're just normal engineers who just want to write code um, and just be normal people. That's all we really want. Um, and then also, of course, you know, Diet Coke and other things like polka dot dresses, but like whatever. OK, so anyway, here's our Docker file. Uh, so let's go back to our documentation and let's actually go through this. Um, running in Kubernetes. So we looked at a build context, and we learned that it's just basically a directory with a Docker file in it. And we learned that Canico, at some point, expects there to be this tarball of this directory that we're going to refer to as a context um, later on. So I think you know, mentally, I'm thinking to myself, like we have one context that is this, this Docker file we just looked at, but we can probably have multiple contexts, plural. Um, somewhere on our file system or maybe stored in like a Git repo or something. And those different contexts are going to like um, sort of represent all the different containers that our team would be building. Um, so for TGIK, we just made that very simple one. OK, so now let's look at running Canico. Um, let's do a quick show of hands. Who wants to do Canico in a Kubernetes cluster first? Let's do, here, I'll write this down so we can see it. Um, and we can jump to what folks want to do, so dot camera. So let's do uh, plus one for Kubernetes first. I was going to write Kates, but since I picked on K slash earlier, I'm going to actually write Kubernetes out all the way. And let's do plus two for running it locally first. Um, and when I say locally, I mean here on my MacBook. 
um, if folks would like to vote, um, we can figure out which one we do first. They're both really interesting to, uh, to see, and we, we're going to learn a lot um, running it both ways. But if uh, you want to vote, if you have an opinion on which one you would like to learn about first, um, feel free to vote now. Um, also, I kind of want to do locally first. I think I'm a plus two, but let's see what other folks have to say. Uh, so Duffy and George, can you, you all like, can we limit this to 1.37 p.m. and uh, let me know which one wins? Because um, I have a feeling all the votes are going to start coming in. And I'm going to kind of start uh, teeing things up while folks are voting. Off the cuff, it looks like I can already almost tell that plus two is winning. Okay, I think I'm going to go with plus two first. Yeah, the plus twos just keep rolling in. Okay, uh, by an overwhelming majority, we have plus twos. I'm sorry for a few folks, uh, Duffy included, who voted plus one. I'm gonna go ahead and go with plus two, uh, running Kubernetes, or I'm sorry, running Canico locally first. So let's go back to my screen. Okay, so if you come down here to the running locally, oh, also thanks for voting everyone, that was exciting. Um, you can see there's two requirements. Uh, number one, Docker, and number two, G Cloud. And then I guess, in general, this is a really good natural segue. This whole Canago project is built by the Google Container Tools Org, which has an affiliation with the Google Container folks. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the assumptions in the software sort of ass assume that you have like an enterprise GKE account or GCP account and that you, uh, you plan on using it. Although there is some support for uh, using S3, and we'll talk about why you might need to do that in a little bit when we get on to pushing a container. Um, but mostly, uh, I just noticed there's a lot of assumptions in a lot of the shell scripts and even the program itself, and I just sort of assume you're running in Google. Uh, so that would be my first uh, gripe with the project is it's, it seems to be tightly coupled to Google. Um, uh, anyway, I'm off in the weeds here. Uh, Angel says, yeah, it makes sense to see it locally first before going into the wild. <laughs> yeah, um, but actually, I think running it locally is actually going to be a little more complicated maybe than running in Kubernetes. Um, running it locally for me actually took a lot more time to get right than getting it running as a pot in Kubernetes. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll start with locally and we'll understand how it works and then we'll just get it up into a pod and uh, we'll learn about some pod statuses along the way. Okay, so the first thing you need to know is if you run this locally, uh, you can build it using make images. So I did this earlier and actually generated some images locally, but we're going to be running the latest version of the container um, from the Google GCR repo. Um, and then in order to run it, you're actually using this shell script here called run in Docker. Um, and then you pass in a few arguments and that actually shows you how you can run this thing locally. Um, so in general, this is, uh, I feel like I've been griping a lot on this episode. Maybe I'm just in a gripey mood today. Um, also, I didn't take my HRT this morning, so that might have something to do with it. Um, but anyway, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, the, oh, the running Docker shell script is, is married and tightly coupled to Google. And then in general, uh, it's in the documentation, it says, do not try to build this or run it locally. This is designed to be ran in a container. Um, and you will always kind of want to run this thing in a container. Um, and I think that's how we're getting away with some of the unprivileged container building um, features here is by actually running the software to generate a second container in a container itself. Um, so that's pretty exciting as well. So what I did in order to give myself a little bit more of a command line feel is uh, if I actually spit out my alias here, you can see all I did was I as aliased Canico to Docker run GCR uh, Canico project executor latest. So if I just want to run that locally, um, I just run this alias and that actually just does a Docker run. You see it takes a second to load and then we just get uh, our good old familiar Go Cobra uh, output here that we see with almost every command line tool we interact with here on TGIK. Let me see if I can't uh, zoom out a little bit. Okay, that's a little bit easier to read. Can folks uh, can folks see that okay? If I, if I run that, is the text big enough for folks at home? Uh, if somebody wants to drop in chat, if they would like it a little bit bigger, feel free to. Um, but here you can see that uh, you execute the program called executor, and then you can pass in a couple of flags. Oh, and look, there's one for the Azure Container Registry config um, as well. And it looks like we have some very simple, like we have this dash dash force uh, command, we have this insecure, um, it'll push to a registry using plain old HTTP. Um, but mostly this command kind of does one thing only, which is just build Docker containers. Um, Saeed says, do you use Docker with Mac for with Kubernetes enabled? So Saeed is asking, and I don't know if I can show this or not. 
Um, here, actually, you know what I can do? I can take a screenshot. Uh, if I use Docker for Mac, and I do, and let's see if I can pull up the screenshot and share it in OBS. Do do. Then it's going to be on my desktop. And where is this thing at? Um, nope. There it is. Oh my gosh, my face looks ridiculous in this. But um, we should. Nope, that's not going to work. Uh, let's see if I can just pull it up here. Anyway, I was going to show you that I do actually run Docker, um, the Kubernetes edge for Docker, but I just don't. Uh, here it is here running. Um, and that just means I have this little Kubernetes drop down here um, if folks want to use that as well. I don't use it very often. Um, basically, it, the only thing I use it for is to manage uh, kube configs because I get like the nice drop down of which my current context is, and that gives me a visual way of switching my kube configs around instead of having to do like the KTX thing that I showed folks on a previous episode. Um, so that's 99% of my use case with it. Anyway, that answers your question, Said. Okay, so going back here, we now know that we have the Canico image that we've pulled down to my local file system, um, and we're able to do a Docker run on that, and we've aliased that to this command here called Canico. Um, the first thing that you should know about building a container with Canico is it does everything in one fell swoop. So with Docker, you can do a Docker build, you can even do a Docker tag and actually give a build a tag. Um, and then after you've built and optionally tagged your image, you do a uh, Docker push, and then that actually is the, the action that pushes it up to some sort of registry. Um, here with Canico, you just sort of have this one command that does all the things. It'll build your image and then simultaneously, well not simultaneously, but um, secondary to that, it will push it up to a container image registry. Um, earlier, I mentioned that a lot of the Canico project is tightly coupled with Google. You see that here as it just assumes you have a GCR um, registry set up, which of course I, I totally do. Um, and as she says, cubectal config view minus minify is another way of doing that as well. Um, so Ashish is um, referring to this command, dash minify, I think it's one dash, no, nope, two dashes. Um, and that kind of gives you the, um, uh, sort of demo-friendly version of which Kubernetes clusters you have up and running without sharing any of your secrets. So that's good to know. Thank you for sharing Ashish. We all know that I have a terrible habit of sharing secrets here live on 2GAK, so that's really handy to know. I wonder if I should, pro I probably should alias that. I can do that later though. Uh, Gustavo says, this looks like an easy way to set context. Please share the link on how to do this with Docker Edge thing you mentioned. Uh, so Gustavo, if actually Duffy or George, could one of you find the, uh, the installing the Kubernetes Edge thing with Docker and put a link in there for Gustavo? Uh, Gustavo, if you haven't had it by the end of the episode, ping me and I'll, I'll look it up and help you find it. Um, but it is pretty handy um, for switching your context just via a drop down. Okay, so we're off in the weeds and I'm trying to keep us focused here. Um, so yeah, if you want to actually do the whole container run thing, you can run the shell script. And let's actually go and take a look at the shell script here. Um, and we're going to do that by we're actually going to go into go source github.com uh, capital Google, annoying, and Canico. And in here, we're actually going to open up the run in Docker shell script, which is what the documentation suggests we should open up. Uh, so we're going to open this up in Emacs. And we can see we have a very simple uh, bash script here. Um, I do love looking at a good bash script as much as I don't necessarily enjoy writing them um, for an enterprise level s situation. But as we all know, the cloud runs on Bash, so this is perfectly fine. OK, so here is our first little input to the program. It says, uh, basically, we need to have three arguments. And if there's not three arguments, it'll just echo this out and um, I think exit or something. It doesn't exit. Oh my god. If anybody wants to open up a PR, uh, that looks like. Uh, might be a little bit better of logic there. Um, so anyway, uh, it assigns one, two, and three to Docker file context and tag. So those are the first three arguments to the program. And then it'll actually check. Uh, here's another example of being tightly coupled to Google. Uh, if you don't have your gcloud application default credentials.json file, it yells at you and says, run this gcloud auth login thing, and it'll configure it for you. So I've already done all that. So all of our creds are all magically working, and we should just be able to run this command. Uh, so, forming this command is actually a bit confusing um, to folks who have never ran this specific command before. Um, and I think we're running into this, this case of the word context meaning something special to the engineers that maybe doesn't necessarily register or resonate with us as users right away. 
so if you look, they're also doing a Docker run. Uh, the first argument is they're mounting, uh, this minus V is mounting a volume, which is basically sharing files between my MacBook and the container that we're running. Uh, so home config G cloud, and we're going to put that in slash root config G cloud. So basically, we're just sharing my G cloud uh, secret information with the container we're doing a Docker run in. Um, Rory says, uh, my annoyance with capital letters and paths got a less once I realized I could set case insensitive tab completion in Bath. First thing I do in every box I log into. Okay, so yeah, Roy also gets annoyed with uh, capital letters and uh, URLs and Git paths, and then they have a case insensitive bash plugin they use to make it easier for them. Sounds like a good idea, Roy. Okay, um, so we're, we pass in our G Cloud credentials, and if we don't have that set, the program will exit. So you can pretty much only run this program if you plan on doing things in G Cloud. Otherwise, you probably want to write a secondary dash script that looks very similar, that doesn't have this check, and maybe doesn't uh, share these specific credentials. Um, so the second volume we mount is the context directory, which remember, this is a directory on my host system, and we're going to mount that to slash workspace within the container. Uh, so we have that context file uh, in the TGIK episode 55 uh, directory that we're going to pass in for the context variable here. Next, we tell it what container we want to run. Uh, in this case, it's the Canico project, executor latest. And the final command here is, now these are arguments to the Canico program that, remember, I just ran on my local here. Uh, the first one is minus F Docker file. Uh, this next one is minus D tag, which is the tag probably isn't the best name for this variable. This is actually the full URL of the registry we want to push to. I don't know why they need a tag. Um, and then it says dash C workspace. And if we actually go and run this again, we can actually see save file. No, I'm not going to save it because I don't want to open up a PR right now. Um, and if we actually run Canico, we can see the minus F, the minus D, and the minus C defined here. So here's minus C, which is context. It says path to the Docker file build context. By default, it goes to workspace, which we saw that in the bash script, so that should be fine. Um, the minus D is the destination. Uh, this was the tag variable in the bash script, um, and this is just the GCR uh, repo that we're, or registry that we're going to push up to. And this last one, minus F, uh, for whatever reason, minus F is Docker file, um, which is, and this is the confusing part. Where is the Docker file in reference to the current working directory in the container, not where is the Docker file on your local host system? So where will the Docker file be after you've mounted that into the container is what we're uh, passing in here. So uh, Duffy says, plus 11, if it weren't for tab completion, I would not be able to computer efficiently. Uh, I don't know. I'm old school. My bash profile is literally just a bunch of aliases uh, that save me keystrokes. I don't really have any magic other than just using regular old vanilla bash. Um, I don't know, just the way I've always been. Uh, so anyway, if we run uh, this Docker, uh, run in Docker shell script, which is here, um, you can see that it's actually going to spit out help, and it says error, you must provide destination, or use no push. OK, so I'm assuming this dash dash no push is how you turn off the second half of the, uh, the Canico build, which is the part that would push up to a registry. So um, if we formulate our command, what, what were the arguments again? Let's see. Uh, so it's path to Docker file. I'm actually going to just echo this um, out. So this is a good trick I like to do if folks don't know this. You can create a comment in your bash terminal, um, and you can just paste like a little bit of like friendly information. And then if you need to get to it, you, it's actually in your bash history, and you can just pull it up, and you can even hit enter. It won't do anything because it's just a comment. And you can sort of get that at the top of your screen whenever you need to. So it just makes working in a terminal a little bit easier. Uh, so anyway, we're going to do run in Docker. Um, the path to our Docker file within the context of the container. So because we're mounting the context directory into slash workspace, the Docker file will be in our working directory. So we're actually just going to write the word Docker file here. That's all you need to do. Uh, the next one is the context directory. Now, this is not within the context. Oh my god, see, this is why we can't use the word context. This is not in the context of the container. This is in the context of my host. Uh, Mac work, uh, my local MacBook that we're working on here. Uh, so that is going to be, uh, and I'm going to type the full path explicitly, users, nova, go path, source, github.com, heptio, tgik, episodes, 55, context. Uh, I know that's very long, but that's where our context for the episode is. Um, and then the next is our image tag. So before we type our image tag, let's just look at my Google console that I have. Uh, really quick. 
So I think it's cloud.google.com. Um, you can click on this console button up here. And this will actually take you to console.cloud.google.com. And I think if we come here, we can do GCR. And you can see they have a Google Container Registry. And here, the name of my registry is Heptio Advocacy. And then you can see I have a bunch of like test containers and test images and TGIK things that I've just used for miscellaneous demos. Um, so anyway, we're going to be creating one live today. So this is our registry that I have set up. So here, I'm going to type gcr.io slash heptio dash advocacy um, slash, let's do TGIK 055. Um, and I don't think we do a tag. I can't remember if you actually give this a tag or not. Let's, let's give it a tag, and then if we uh, need to get rid of it later, we can. OK, so this should, if I typed everything correctly, actually um, build a container and push it to G GCR called TGIK-055. Uh, like fingers and toes. Let's see what happens here. So run in Docker. OK, so it says downloading base image Ubuntu. Uh, no matching credentials were found, failing back on an anonymous, extracting layers 0, 1, 2, and 3. There's our Dockerfile command that, remember, we looked at earlier, the world's simplest Dockerfile. Um, and then it says GCR Heptio Advocacy TGIK latest. Okay, so a lot just happened, and probably the most important thing that just happened is I ran this as my Knova, unprivileged user. So I was able to actually build a container image and push it to GCR using an unprivileged uh, user. Um, by running the command that generated the container image in a container itself. Um, and that blog I shared earlier talks about how this is possible, but the TLTR is this uh, concern about accessing this thing called run proc that Jesse has a PR open for. Um, anyway, I don't want to go off too deep in the weeds there, but it is possible, um, and we just did it here live. Uh, so anyway, we can actually go to GCR, and if we refresh this, we should see that we have... Uh, TGIK 055, and let's see if our latest tag made it in here. Yes, it did. Okay, so we, we did, we were able to actually pass in the tag, and it respected that. Okay, so that's it. I mean, that was building a container image with Canico locally using an unprivileged user by running it in a container. Uh, because we're running this in a container, this is also important because you would be able to run almost this exact same bash command um, on a Linux file system, or, or Linux operating system, a Linux host, um, and still get a container image built and pushed. So now uh, the first question I had was like, okay, but does it work with other container registries? And um, do I have to be authenticated to Google Cloud? And there's this whole like um, being married to Google set of concerns that I had. And I think there is a lot of work. We saw that they had the Azure registry config uh, command line flag they took. And I know there was some stuff in the documentation about S3, which is relevant when we run in Kubernetes. Um, so I think maybe, you know, if folks are interested in getting this, this level of parity in other systems, I'm assuming pull requests are accepted. Uh, and I think it's more of a cosmetic change and not necessarily an underlying system change because you're actually getting all the advantages of running in a container uh, to build more containers. So it should run anywhere. Uh, so anyway, that's my rant about if you want to go contribute to Canico or uh, even write some documentation on how you were able to get it up and running uh, with other registries might be a, a really cool opportunity for folks to get involved. Okay, so uh, does anybody have any questions about running locally or should I switch over to running in Kubernetes? Um, I think probably the only thing I wanted to point out is the Docker file itself. Um, and if you go into the Canico code base. So I've checked this out locally. Let me um, let me zoom in here. This takes a moment, so bear with me. Uh, so I think I go there, and then I can go view, tool, windows, I want project. Okay, yeah, so this should be a little bit easier for folks to see. Um, if you actually go into the Canico code tree and then go into this deploy directory, you'll actually see that we have a Docker file. And if you go and you look at the make file, um, and we find the build images, um, this last target here, this last make target here, you can see that we actually uh, build this deploy Docker file, um, uh, doing a Docker build minus T. So we're actually using Docker in our make file to generate the container that we can then build other containers with. This is so interesting because we're, we're back to GCC all over again. Like we're back to using other compilers to cross compile our compiler uh, so that we can compile other code um, all over again. Uh, so anyway, that's how they were able to get it up and running using Docker. Um, and then after the 
this, this image is built, we then have this ability to generate more containers and self-replicate further. Um, but if we actually look at this Docker file, you can see it's, it's very primitive. Like we actually do this from scratch thing down here. Um, and the way that this works is we actually perform the first half of these tasks on a Golang container image. And we like do some busy work here. Um, we do some, here's more um, hard-coded GCR stuff. But uh, we actually go in and we run some commands. We tar some stuff up and then we run this make. Um, and then after that's done, we hit line 28 and it says from scratch, which means we kind of hit reset on what's inside of the container. And then we do a very, very simple copy uh, command a couple of times and actually really build this extremely primitive container. So this is kind of cool because it actually makes running the container a lot faster, but it's kind of annoying because you can't really debug anything. And to give you an example of that, uh, me being the curious hacker that I am, of course wanted to go and inspect this container before I ran it on TGIK. Uh, so how I tried to do that is, um, what's the name of this? Let me pull this back up really quick. Um, what It's called Canico Executor, but I think it's Canico Project Executor. Where's the actual name of, uh, I can get it here. Uh, alias grep for Canico. I want this container name, this one here. Okay, so if you actually try to do a Docker run on this thing, Docker run IT minus this and try to do like, let's do bin bash. Um, nothing, it just runs the command for you. And it's like, okay, so the entry point is hard coded. So um, if you're a really awesome, clever hacker, you can come in and actually do this entry point command and say bin bash. Um, and you're like, okay, now I, you know, I'm really got it this time. I know the workaround. And you try to run it, and then you get this error that says, it's sorry, I can't even find bin bash. And if you actually go and try to like do shell or even try to do like a simple like ls, like let's just try to do ls, right? Like that should exist on a file system. Um, you'll see that none of these commands here. And by re like eliminating all of these other things that we expect to be inside of a container, we actually end up uh, making it harder for people to to break into this. Uh, so this is actually a really interesting security uh, feature that's super annoying for folks like me who are actually trying to like gain access to the container and inspect and see what's going on there. Uh, Josh says, I submitted your suggestion change to the script as PR415. Thank you, Josh. Uh, that was really awesome. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's very primitive container, no bells and whistles whatsoever. It pretty much does one thing and does it well, which is just to run the Canico builder. Uh, so pros and cons there of doing the from scratch and actually building a very explicit, simplified container that we see here. <coughs> and then you can see the entry point here is uh, Canico slash executor. So first half of the Docker file, building our Go binary. Second half of the Docker file, um, simplifying our container and making it as bare bones as possible. Um, so clever Docker file here, folks, very clever. Okay, so that's how the Canico container image is built. So now we want to run this thing in Kubernetes and actually get a feel for what it's like running in Kubernetes. And uh, I'll save the opinions about, um, you know, if this is a good idea or a bad idea till the end here. But if folks want to start the banter now about um, running a container building container inside of Kubernetes and what that might mean for you and your team, feel free to let it rip. Um, Saeed says, uh, I use Docker multi-stage build uh, but use Alpine for the latest image instead of Scratch. Okay, and Duffy says from Scratch is the bomb. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's the bomb for security, but it's annoying for engineers, like story of my life. Um, so yeah, uh, from Scratch is, is handy. If, if folks have never seen that before, the multi-stage build stuff, it's pretty exciting with Docker. Okay, so let's, let's go back and let's actually look at running this thing in Kubernetes. Uh, so let's pull up our documentation. Do, do, do. Um, where's our running in Kubernetes? It's up here at the top. Okay, cool. Um, running Canico in a Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so running Canico in a Kubernetes cluster is requirements. You need a standard Kubernetes cluster. Let's make sure we have one of those. Uh, Kget nodes. Yes, uh, I created the Cubicorn cluster beforehand, uh, running in AWS. Uh, I guess if folks are curious, I can just give you a quick behind the scene here. And then also, like, I feel like this is normal for me to be like, I'm going to create a container in a Google container registry running in a cluster in Amazon. Uh, to me, that doesn't really, like, scare me and seems like a normal part of my day. But if you rewind four or five years ago before containers and cloud native was really, you know, as big as it is now, um, this is 
kind of new. Like the fact that we're running all these different things in multiple clouds and they're kind of working harmoniously together is kind of proof that this whole cloud thing is kind of working. Um, so this is exciting. Uh, so anyway, going into EC2, uh, world's simplest Kubernetes cluster using Cubicorn. Um, we should have two instances, yeah, two running instances. Uh, we have a master and a node for a TGIK 055, and we can actually see what version of Kubernetes are running. Uh, you do K version, and you can see um, running 1.10.2 uh, and 1.10.4. Okay, so that's my Kubernetes cluster that we're going to be running uh, the Canico container in to build other containers and push those to uh, the Google Container Registry. Uh, so Automay says also you can probably create a Docker file based on this container and just copy a few debug tools into it. Okay, so Auto, oh, actually Automay had another comment above that. Um, I think it should technically be possible to run a program from outside of running Docker inside the Docker namespace. Okay, so I'm gonna comment on your second one here, Automay, um, which is you can take the, uh, the Docker file here and actually like make a copy of it and like have like the debug version of uh, the Canico build executor, which actually uh, might be handy for folks if they wanted to go and actually debug their software. Mm -hmm. And I noticed there was a couple of, yeah, right here, Dockerfile debug. Um, so it looks like they've already kind of done this for us. And I bet this is gonna give us, if we look at it, yeah, we're still doing it from scratch, but I bet we're getting a lot more um, built into our container that makes it a little bit easier to debug. And it does, uh, it looks like it's a busy box volume as well. Um, so yeah, if you wanted to create a different Docker file and build that container and debug it, you totally could. Uh, so thanks for that mention, uh, Automa. That was good to point out. Okay, so let's go back to running in Kubernetes. Uh, we have our Kubernetes cluster. So where's our documentation? Uh, we have this first bit satisfied. And of course, uh, you know, you can create one with GKE if you want. Uh, I just did it Cubicorn and Amazon because I have aliases for those commands and I'm super lazy. Um, and then we need this Kubernetes secret. Okay, so this took me maybe 20 or 25 minutes yesterday to, to get this dialed in correctly. Um, but I will just walk folks through what they need to do so that you kind of have like the, the TLDR, what are, what are the steps I really need to know about. Okay, so in order to create the secret, it says uh, to create the secret, you first need to create a service account if you want to push the final image with storage admin permissions, and then you can download this JSON key for it. So basically what they're saying is come to GCP, type service account right here, um, find this thing that says is called service accounts, which is like G GCP's version of IAM stuff. Um, IAM stuff, official term there. Uh, this is how you control users and what they can and can't do in your cloud. Uh, so anyway, come in here, you can see that I've created this Canico image. I don't think I'm gonna expose any secrets because I think they're kind of like uh, uh, obfuscated to use the correct security word. And I think if I click on that, uh, you can see I have a key ID, but the actual cert material, the important security stuff is hidden from view. And um, I can like uh, hit this edit button up here at the top and I can delete this key um, and I can create a new one. And then actually like if, let's, let's do this, let's create a key um, and you hit JSON and you can hit create. And then if you watch down here in the corner, uh, you can see this Heptio advocacy JSON file was downloaded to my uh, local um, file system. And there's a really important step that's not in the documentation that I'm about to tell you about, so make sure you're paying attention. Um, so you would take this file, um, and for us, let's go back to our TGIK repo, source, github.com, uh, heptio, actually I have this alias now, I can just type TGIK, and then go into episodes, and then go into 55. Um, okay, so I have the secret here, and let's do a tree to make this easier for folks. Uh, I have the secret here that I'm not going to cut out, but if you notice, I renamed it to canicosecret.json. And if you look, the, uh, the secret I just downloaded is in my downloads directory, and it's called Heptio Advocacy. Uh, let's do this one. It's got this long name here. Now, if you actually tried to use that secret and pass it into the, the pod command that we're about to define, it's not going to mount, and you're going to have a bad time. So you actually have to rename your secret to meet what you're going to define in the pod spec in a moment, which, uh, let's do tree again, um, is this Canico secret.json here. Okay, so you downloaded your IAM JSON file, you renamed it to Canico secret, and you put it somewhere safe where you're not going to accidentally commit it to GitHub, um, which is what we have here. Uh, so let's go back to our documentation. And then you do this cubectal create secret. 
Um, and this is why we're naming it is important. So if you do this cubectal create, and I'll copy everything up to from file. Um, and actually, before I, I do that, I've already done a lot of this. So I'm going to do cubectal get secrets and cubectal delete secret can it co secret. OK, so now I can run this command from file. And I'm going to just call it the canico secret.json file here in my uh, current directory. So poof, canico secret created. So now, after that is done, uh, it basically gives us a pod spec. So this is like, I'm going to go off in a couple of minutes here talking about pods and Kubernetes. So you know, grab a cup of tea. Um, the, the pod spec here is exciting because we're not associating a higher level pod management resource with this. So usually if you run a pod in Kubernetes, you're going to get like a stateful set or a daemon set or a deployment or there's all of, there's the, you know, different ways of, of creating and managing pods automatically. So what this documentation is alluding to is that we are going to create a pod ad hoc um, and that pod's entire job is going to be to create one container image and push that up to an image registry for us. So it's handy because we would be able to sort of have this pod that we know is only doing one thing, and we would be able to get the status of that pod. Um, so we're effectively using a Kubernetes pod as our CI CD system. But it would also allude to, if you wanted to do this sort of like for real, you're going to need some tooling that's going to do a cubectal apply and run a pod and then maybe check the status and make sure everything worked out OK. And then if it didn't, maybe it wants to re maybe you want to rerun it again. But you're getting off in the weeds and you're sort of reinventing some of these, uh, these deployment tools as well. So uh, you could use a Kubernetes cron, for instance, to run this like every hour. Um, but ultimately, if you wanted to have some sort of worker queue that would create pods as needed, you as an engineer would need to come up with some tooling to actually make this happen by running it in Kubernetes. So that's the first pod rant. The second one here is in order uh, for you to build a container image, you're probably going to have to interact with underlying parts of the host file system that are probably very delicate on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and that blog that I shared earlier would allude to some of these things. But running this pod that has this sort of natural built-in capability to, uh, to influence those and to interface with those presents a fairly large security uh, concern for you and your cluster. So we've been talking about it a little bit internally here at Heptio. I had a couple of engineers suggest things like maybe you would want to cordon this pod off so that it only runs on like the designated like this is our this is our node that builds containers and we don't actually run any workloads on it. Um, but either way, you're you're introducing a lot of risk uh, and potentially some engineering complexity for actually running this in Kubernetes as a pod. So just be aware of that if you if you plan on actually entertaining the idea of of creating containers inside of Kubernetes using a pod. Okay, so that's my soapbox. Uh, I know folks probably have strong opinions there. Feel free to share. I'm happy to read them out for for others watching. So anyway, let's go ahead and let's, uh, let's take this pod definition and let's kind of plug in our bits that we're going to be using here on TGIK. Uh, so let's go to our terminal and let's actually cat out. Um, I have this example pod1.yaml that is in the TGIK repo already. And actually, let's not cat this out. Let's, uh, let's YOLO. Let's go, go big or go home here. We're going to open this up in Emacs. OK, so uh, let's go through this kind of line by line. We don't have very much YAML this week, and I don't want to disappoint folks at home by not looking at a bunch of YAML. Uh, so anyway, we define some metadata, which is the name, set to Canico for our spec. This is where the rubber meets the road for running the Kubernetes cluster. And this is going to mimic that run in Docker uh, shell script that we just ran earlier to generate a container image locally. Um, and here, uh, also a bit confusing, but in the run in Docker shell script, we use the shorthand, remember, minus F for uh, the Docker file flag. Here, we're going all out uh, the long, explicit dash, dash Docker file flag, which those are the same thing. Uh, and we're setting that to Docker file again. And this is, again, this goes back to the context thing and the whole uh, concept of like needing to uh, you know, have a context. And then inside of that context, which remember is really just a directory, where's your Docker file? For us, it's just the only thing in that directory. So we just have to just say Docker file. Um, and then we say context is equal to GS uh, colon whack whack Chris Nova. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. What's going on here? 
Um, and if you actually go back to your documentation, um, it says you need a standard Kubernetes cluster and a Kubernetes secret. Uh, you also need um, to upload your context to some cloud storage uh, utility as well. And this is where the S3 uh, stuff that I talked about a little bit earlier comes into play. So what you don't see here is that the Kubernetes cluster needs some way to mount this context, whatever it is. Uh, and in this case, we're going to upload ours to the Google uh, file store using this command line tool called gsutil. Um, and we have to create this tarball to make all of this stuff happen. And then Kubernetes will pull down that tarball and mount that tarball uh, after it's untarred it into our container. And then it will be able to access our Docker file that we've defined locally here on my, my MacBook. Uh, we have a question. It says, what are minimum resources needed to run Canico? Wondering. Uh, so concretely, if you want to run it locally, we just looked at how to do that. And basically, all you needed um, was some sort of container runtime uh, and just to run an image. And then you need like some special cloud uh, security or cloud authentication stuff in place to make everything kind of work. Um, but you're able to run it unprivileged. Uh, and then here in Kubernetes, uh, we were just done talking about how here are two out of the three requirements. The first one is a cluster. The second one is a Kubernetes secret. And the third one is uh, some sort of file store that is accessible uh, via HTTPS, uh, such as S3 or the Google Cloud one that we're using. Um, and Andreas says, perhaps you can use locally context too. Like perhaps you can mount a different Kubernetes storage to the pod and then find the context there. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Andreas, if you want to find uh, something you want me to pull up, I'm happy to, to take a look at that. I'm just going to go this way because this is the way the documentation alluded to, and I kind of have myself teed off here. But if there's another way to do that, I'm super curious. OK, so um, here at the bottom is where it kind of alludes to this third requirement that says, this example pulls the build context from a GCS bucket. Uh, to use a local directory build context, you could consider using config maps to mount in small build context. OK, so instead of using um, an online file store like S3, it says you could use a config map, which is a Kubernetes object as well. I think it still uh, follows this pattern of like you sending your Docker file up somewhere that Kubernetes can, can then pull it down from. Um, and whether you want to do that via config map and keep everything in your cluster or have some sort of external dependency, you can have that as well. Um, it might be interesting, this is like the engineer brain of me thinking here, to have some sort of uh, operator um, that would watch a directory, like say an S3, as you uploaded context to it, um, would go and automatically build those and spit them out for you. Uh, and that could sort of, the operator could then manage actually de creating, configuring, deploying, and then deleting all of these pods as little worker pods. Uh, that might be an interesting project if folks are uh, wanting to take this next step further. OK, so anyway, let's get our context with the world's simplest Docker file um, up into uh, Google Cloud uh, hosted somewhere as a tarball so that we can pull it down using our, our cluster. So to do that, we go back to our Canico build context. And this is where the stuff that we looked at at the beginning of the episode comes into play. Uh, so let's create our tarball doing this command here. Um, let me get out of this really quick. Uh, so we'll paste our command. It says tar minus cap C uh, path to build context, which in our case is this directory here locally called context uh, zzcvf context.tar.gz, this whole directory. Uh, so you can see we, the lowercase a needs added. We've added uh, the Docker file to our tarball. And if we list here, you can see we now, uh, well, we had one before, but we just recreated it, um, this context.tar.gzip. And then if you want to use uh, gsutil to do this, you certainly can. Um, but you would be able to use S3 here as well. So we're going to copy the first half of this. And we're going to paste this in here. And we need to get our bucket name. So to do that, let's come here. And I uh, am actually just going to type bucket. And you can see that we have these things, uh, these things called storage buckets. Oh, I don't want to create one. Um, I want to go to storage. Uh, and you can see I have chrisnova-tgik as uh, a, uh, an object store here in Google Cloud. So chrisnova-tgik. Uh, so that should do it. gsutil cp context. And poof, uh, because I've already done my uh, gsutil login, I was able to uh, copy this context tarball up to Google Cloud. And then now, uh, just like all object stores in the cloud, um, you could actually go and you could curl this tarball down 
um, as I just did here. And you can see I have contacts.tar just downloaded here to my local MacBook. Uh, so you would be able to get um, this tarball downloaded virtually from anywhere in the internet, which is cool. Um, and because our Kubernetes cluster has access to the internet, our Kubernetes cluster can now get our tarball. So again, uh, we're doing this all over the public internet. Security concerns there. If you're perhaps running some sort of proprietary software or a Docker file that you don't want folks to see, uh, you might want to look at uh, tightening the screws on that just a little bit more as well. Okay, so anyway, let's go back to our uh, pod um, and let's look at and see how we have this thing configured now that we've uploaded this context tarball as the third requirement that we didn't know we needed to do. Uh, so remember, we have our Docker file that is just called Docker file. Um, our context is uh, GS, Google Storage, Chris Nova, TGIK, context.tar.gzip. Um, so if you had software in place, you probably want to give this thing a unique name. Um, and then destination is this is where we want to tell Canico to push our container image to once it's done. Uh, and we're going to pass in GCR, have to advocacy, TGIK app latest. Uh, and then you can see all the rest of this is basically just mounting the secret that we created earlier so that it has all of the auth credential information it needs to actually push this container image up to um, uh, GCR. Well, oh, just drew a blank. Okay, and let's call this, I think we did TGIK 055 latest. Um, and we have our secret here, and that looks good to me. And so this is really cool. So I'm going to type a pretty long command so folks get to see this whole thing happen in real time. So the first bit of our command is going to apply this YAML file, um, which is that. The second command we're going to run immediately afterwards is going to be a kget po. And then I wish there was, and then I think I have a klog. I'm actually going to do this. klog um, canico. Minus F. I think that should work. K log is an alias. It's a bash function I wrote that just looks up a pod and will get the logs based on a, a string. And that string is Canico. So any pod that has the word Canico in it, we're just going to grab logs for it. Uh, so this should work. Uh, nope. The first half. Oh, OK, hold on. This is why it didn't work. I've already got a pod running from earlier. <laughs> uh, so now's a good s chance to point out the status here is completed which means the pod exited. And because we don't have a deployment or a stateful set or a daemon set attached to this pod, once it's completed and it exited zero, Kubernetes is done with it. It's done everything that you told it to do, so it just goes into state completed. And there's effectively nothing running there. There's not a container running anymore, but we have a reference to an old container that used to be running. So we want to tell Kubernetes to go ahead and delete that pod um, called Canico. So now let's do this klog command again and see if this works. OK, um, perfect. OK, so it did work, but we're just waiting for the container to start. Uh, clog canico. OK, perfect. Uh, so we have some errors here. Let's see what happened. Uh, so we were able to create the pod, and it says error resolving context. Uh, Chris Nova OAuth cannot fetch bad request, tar.gzip. Um, and then you can see that our our pod actually erred here. So what this is telling me is that this is actually not resolvable, which means, did I make a typo? I bet I did make a typo. tar.gz, and what is our gsutil? Uh, yep, I totally did. tar.gz. Um, so now let's try to upload that. Or the destination must be restarted. The destination bucket, GS Chris Nova. TJK, oh, I know why, I know why. Come on, folks. Everybody makes mistakes. OK, context.tar.gzip. Let's run that. Bam. OK, so now we have that uploaded. So now let's get our pods, delete this pod. Um, notice it's in status error, which means the pod is no longer running. K delete PO, Canico. And let's do our, uh, our big command again here creates the pod, and let's, uh, it's still too soon to get logs. Let's do kget po. Still in status error, uh, klogs, the name of the pod, minus f. Uh, it still says that it cannot find this tarball. Let's see if we can find it. This is just me debugging, trying to figure out what's going on here. Uh, OK, so it doesn't work. ChrisNova-TGIK, context.tar.gzip. And 
and Chris Nova, TGIK, context.tar.gzip. Why is that not resolving? This was totally working earlier. Let's see. Uh, how do I get the actual uh, export to cloud pub sub? No, I just want to know like the URL for this thing. Hmm. Why does this not want to work? K get PO. Let's try this one more time. K delete Canico. Oh, sorry. K delete PO. Canico. I'm going to kind of wipe everything and start from scratch and see if we can't get this. Um, but it should work really, really well. I had it working earlier. I'm not sure why it's not working now. Uh, so let's delete this. Delete that. And um, let's run our gsutil again. Uh, copy context up here. Operation completed. Let's make sure this gets refreshed. Uh, storage class multi-regional public access not public. I wonder if that's right. Um, yeah, okay, so now if you hover over this, um, I wish I could do this, but if you look down in the bottom left above my downloads here, it now has the correct URL. Um, so I'm wondering if just deleting and recreating, let's see if this fixes it. Um, Let's see, still not wanting to download. Chris Nova, TGIK, tar.gzip. And let's see what this says. I'm gonna try to just paste this in and see what we get. Um, and I'm gonna get rid of this, this argument to our git URL. Okay, so that did work. Uh, so let's maybe try to get this and just put this in our pod definition and see if we can't get that to work. Uh, so let's k delete po canico, and let's emacs this command again. Emacs example pod one, and we're just going to paste in this URL that we just validated working, and let's see what happens. Uh, people are saying a lot of things. I'm going to try this, and then if not, I'm going to read what folks are saying. Let's see if Canico is going to allow us to use an HTTPS instead of a GS colon backslash backslash. It should work, but who knows? Software is always finicky. So let's try to apply this again. Kget PO, container creating, status error again. K logs, Canico. Oh, yep, sure enough. Can only use GS colon, dir, or S3. Okay, so let's go back and let's change that back. Emacs, example one, pod.yaml, do two. Uh, and actually, let's, let's just do this. Uh, get reset hard, bam. And now let's open this thing up again. Uh, okay, so here is our, dust, our context again. Uh, GS Chris Nova TJK context.tar.gzip. So now let's go back here. Let's see what folks are saying. Tom says make it public. I'm not a super big Google user, so how would I make this thing public? Manage holds? Nope, that's not it. Uh, is it over here maybe? Edit permissions? Uh, add item entity? No, I don't know. How would I make this thing public? Bucket lock, permissions, edit bucket maybe? Multi-regional, show advanced settings, nope. Let's see what this says, public. Uh, do I just do like edit over here? Edit metadata maybe? Um, edit permissions, nope. Uh, Tom says permissions. So let's try to go into permissions. Tom, thank you for helping me out here and teaching me how to Google. Um, uh, it said user anyone is what people are saying. So can we do user uh, anyone? No. Do, do. 
do fail to update permissions, try again later. Save. I wonder if we could try to use S3. Let's see if we get any clues here. Um, it says public, object me accessed. Yeah, that's what we want, but how do we change it? Learn more. To stop sharing an object publicly, I want to start sharing an object publicly. Making data public. Uh, it looks like somebody suggested all users. Let's try that. Edit permissions, uh, user, all users. Hey, hey, that was it. Uh, looks like uh, balance Pato is our one uh, with the correct syntax. So let's try this now. Um, thank you for that, that was really helpful. Uh, users, all users, yeah. Uh, so I think we got that. So let's save this and now let's try to run this again. K delete PO Canico. Wow, that was really unuser friendly to make that thing public. You, I was really expecting there to be like some sort of like click here to make this public button. Uh, so that was kind of annoying, uh, but we got it. Thank you. That was very helpful. Uh, K delete PO Canico. And now let's try this thing again. Okay, so K apply minus F, our example pod, um, K get PO container creating. Still in status error. This is like the story of my life. Uh, let's see what's going on this time. Uh, not found. Resolving context. Uh, we want GS. Right? I thought that, didn't we change that to GS? And that is resolvable. I don't know what it's talking about. I just downloaded it. Uh, K get PO. K delete PO can it co and what's going on in our example.yaml context is yeah that looks right let's try this again K get PO okay really weird I don't know why that last one didn't work but we're running now I'm glad I reran that again okay so that took seven minutes so that was a little bit longer than expected but once you figure out how to use your cloud storage uh, and you have your context tarball uh, tar um, up and running, it's actually really easy to create a pod. So we can actually go and pull the logs for this now, and this is where everything is gonna, it's gonna come together here at the end, and uh, you know, we can have a big round of applause. No, uh, so it still is saying that it can't fetch this bad request. Uh, get HTTPS storage, Chris Nova, Contacts, invalid grant, error description, invalid JWT signature. This is really weird. And then I wonder if I do a K get PO if we're in error again. Yeah, we are. Okay. What's going on with this Google Cloud Store? I'm about to switch over to S3 because I know S3 way more. Let's see. Uh, if we can find documentation on S3. Uh, Balliant said, how's the secret set up? Um, that's a good question. Well, we did the create secret command earlier that we saw here. And I created the secret. I mean, we can create a new secret for good measure, why not? Um, so let's rm rf canico secret, get rid of that. Let's, um, Go back here to service account. All I'm doing right now is creating a new secret, just for good measure, just to try something. Um, and if not, uh, we can try to run this thing in S3. Anyway, uh, the desired behavior here, as soon as you get all this stuff hammered out, is um, basically it just does what we ran locally and just creates uh, a container and pushes it up for, up for you, and it's almost the exact same one for one that we saw locally, and you'll get those in the Quebecto logs. And then you're, uh, as long as the secret's configured correctly, you'll be able to push that up to GCR. Um, I don't know why the secret would have anything to do with the HTTP request, but we should totally just for good measure roll it anyway and just see what's going on. Um, Bialant says, it seems GCS is complaining about the JWT format, which is the token in the secret. Oh, interesting. So I guess those do have something with each other. So let's nuke this and let's just start fresh. So delete that, create key. Um, actually, before we do this, yeah, do we want to make it just a new a service account? Yeah, let's just do, let's just go yellow and create a whole new thing. Okay, so create service account. 
uh, TGIK live 55, um, create, and then we want to make sure we give it the, it says here in the documentation, um, under build context. Uh, Canico supports, let's go back here, build context. Uh, supports local directories, cloud storage. It tells you what kind of permissions you need. Uh, let's grab for service account. There it is. Okay, so to create a service account, you'll need to create a service account in the Google Cloud project uh, with storage admin is what we want. That's the magic phrase. So we should be able to type that here. Storage admin, bam, continue. Uh, and then we do create key, JSON, and download that. Uh, so let's grab this name here and let's copy downloads slash heptio dash advocacy paste that dot json to canico dash secret dot json uh, k get secrets k delete secret canico secret and let's apply this thing again. Uh, secret, Kubernetes secret here, and this is what we want. And I see folks in chat, so one second, I'll check. Let me create the secret first. From file, uh, can it go secret uh, it's it, Folks are saying they love watching me debugging. Uh, this is, I guess this is the part that everybody joins for, but it's always the part I struggle with the most, because I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. Uh, but yeah, this is just, this is like the, the good TGIK meat here is the, uh, the debugging part. Okay, so kget secrets. Um, so we have a secret that looks good. Kget po, k delete po canico. Ah, not canico secret. Why did I tab him there? K delete po canico, and then k apply minus f example pod one yaml. I uh, kget po container creating running. Oh my gosh, what are the logs going to say? K logs, Canico. Ah, it worked. Yay, this is like the best part. Rock on. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So, yeah. Okay, really weird. And I'm glad we found this because this is another thing we should totally uh, point out for users, which is that secret is way more relevant than you would expect it to be. Um, it looks like the JWT signature, I'm assuming maybe I just created the secret wrong earlier or um, there was something going on and that secret was faulty in some way. Uh, and so creating a new one seemed to fix the problem. Um, and we were then able to actually pull down from the Google Cloud Store uh, storage engine and actually get the, uh, the context tarball. Uh, but for whatever reason, the secret was influencing the way that we were pulling from Google Cloud. So I'm wondering if uh, it was just automatically trying to use it or something because it was in place. Um, so yeah, hats off to Bal, I'm, I'm sure I'm saying this wrong, but Valiant uh, for helping us out. Um, that was really helpful. The the users equal to all users, and then the uh, the JWT token were our two big hints there. Um, but anyway, so now we've got Echo TGIK is the best way to learn Kubernetes, and if all goes according to plan, uh, Jeremy says, did you delete the wrong key earlier? Would have to check the stream. Uh, I don't know what I did, Jeremy. Maybe I did like accidentally delete the wrong key. Um, because earlier, remember, I deleted a key after I created one just to show folks how to create it. Maybe that could have been it as well. Um, but go back. I'm sure, like, this is like watching a Quentin Tarantino movie. Like, go back in time and, like, look at the clues and see how I messed up. Um, feel free to add a comment in the YouTube video and, and pick on me and tell me where I goofed up. Uh, anyway, we're actually going to see if we can get TGIK as the best way to learn Kubernetes by doing a local Docker run, and that will kind of be our round-robin test for Canico for the day. So Docker run... Uh, the name of our container image and registry. So gcr.io slash heptio advocacy uh, slash tgik055 tag latest. Um, and we should pull it down. Um, already exists. Uh, tgik, uh, the best way to learn Kubernetes and sleep for a thousand. Uh, I, I, I'm assuming that uh, it looks like the echo echoed everything out. Anyway, uh, we were able to actually run a command in a container that we built in a container in Kubernetes and pushed up to GCR uh, and pull it down here locally and everything worked as expected. So that's the round robin test of creating a container image, 
uh, locally pushing it up to GCR, creating a container image in an Amazon cluster of all things, pushing it to GCR, um, tinkering with the secrets and understanding that they are relevant, much more relevant than you would think, um, especially for the pull part. Um, learning that the, uh, the prefix of how you're defining your destination is important because I think the software does magic things with it, which would probably explain why that secret is relevant. Um, and then actually being able to pull everything back down and get it running uh, here via a Docker run. Okay, so it's that part of the episode where I zoom out and I say, thanks for joining everyone. And uh, this is you know a little bit delayed. So every week I feel like I always need some sort of filler here for the next minute or so while I start saying goodbye and we want folks to have an opportunity to say goodbye and I would like to, to read what folks are saying. Or more importantly, see if anybody has any questions that I could answer really quick um, about Canico or unprivileged container builds or building uh, containers in Kubernetes and pros and cons with them and what all that stuff might mean or how all of that stuff might play out. Um, so I'm here uh, for the next few minutes if you have questions, and if not, it's been a lovely episode. Thanks for everybody who joined, and thanks for helping me debug. It's been a ton of fun. Um, and, you know, keep building container images, and if you can, try to build them unprivileged. And if you can, help contribute to tools like Canico or Builda to make it a little bit easier for folks like me trying to do demos or folks like you uh, trying to improve your organization's container building pipeline. Uh, feel free to, to help out. Open Source is all about contributions from folks just like me and just like you. Uh, Josh says, thank you. My PR was already merged. So you said that was 4.15, Josh. Let's, let's actually look at this really quick. So that was to this. So pull requests. Uh, so we can actually just cheat and do 4.15. Uh, adding exit one, running Docker script, you'll get all of the happy faces from me. Cool. Uh, thanks for opening up a PR. That's really great and funny that we got one merged live in TGIK. Uh, Vialent says, thank you, great session. Have a great weekend. Y'all do the same. Uh, I think I'm climbing a mountain this weekend. Who would have guessed? Um, we're just going to wait and see what the weather does. So I hope everybody has good plans for the weekend. Take some time off from Kubernetes. We're not going anywhere. We'll be back next week. Take a break. You all deserve it. Um, and thanks for, for joining us live from the, the Heptio studios. It's been a wonderful, wonderful week, and I think we're ready for our weekend. So, uh, oh, Tom, let's see. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Heptio. Hopefully, you guys come down to New Zealand for the LinuxConf in January. Uh, hopefully, us girls come down there, too, uh, because I definitely want to climb Mount Cook. Uh, which is it's harder than the route on Mount Cook, just to let you guys know. You, see, I just did it. You folks know uh, is actually harder than Liberty Ridge where I broke my hand. Uh, so you can see how insane I am and how intense the mountains are in New Zealand. Uh, I haven't heard of the Linux Conf, but I will definitely check it out. Uh, international travel is always a bit hands up. We never really know if it's going to make sense or not, but I'll definitely check it out and hopefully we can come see you. I know we have uh, Dave down in Australia, so it might make sense to do like a little down under tour uh, and come down and see what's going on on that, that side of the world. Uh, that's really in the future. Uh, my favorite part is that side of the world. Um, already on their weekend, uh, Saeed says, London is returning to form next week. Weather-wise, it's been unusually warm recently. That's good to know. Um, I'm excited to be in London. Primarily excited for the Curry and Brick Lane, but it'll be a good time and come check out my keynote. It's going to be a really cool keynote talking about more Kubernetes. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm going to get out of here, go enjoy my weekend, and do my snippets for the week. Have a great week, everyone.